Good evening, everyone out there in the world, and to you, Miss Anaka. Thank you, uh, PSU, uh, for having us today. My name is Danae Howard, also known as Art School Scammer from Brooklyn, New York, here to sit and speak with an amazing artist and so much more. I'm going to give her time to speak to you guys herself. Oh, hey, I'm Anaka. Um, thank you, Danae, for being here. Thank you, Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at PSU for having me. Um, I grew up in Portland. I call myself an artist, an alchemist, and an archivist. Um, I'm really interested in ethnographic research and how to document our experiences and our practices, um, specifically around sacred wisdom and creation building through film and photography. So for the past 10 years or so, I've been documenting artists um, and creators in my community in this project called Activate Archive. Um, so what I'm showing in this exhibition is a continuation of a series called Activate Portals, where I'm presenting um, real life experiences of what's within the archive. This particular performance is just me performing in the trees that raised me in Portland, Oregon. Okay, and we can hear it from here. Yeah, so here's a clip, a two minute clip from the film. shared some beautiful clips of your work. I want to get into um, knowing more about what was just shown. I want to ask what is your connection to the places you have performed in and what is the intention of this work? Um, okay, so this is the first time that I filmed a performance of myself and presented it as a piece in a gallery such as this. Um, and because the gallery show is surrounding black artists from Portland. I wanted to dedicate the location to being from here. I feel myself dancing with the trees who raised me, meaning the trees that are um, near where I grew up and a place where I was able to go to a lot as a kid. Um, my grandmother, who was an amazing farmer and medicine woman and just overall amazing person, I grew up in her home, so I wanted to create something in the space that was an ode to my child self and also ode to my ancestors who raised me. And also an ode to the trees who raised me too, because they saw me grow up, which is pretty cool. Yeah, we took a 
trip to the trees today. Yeah, we and got to go say hi to them and before we came here. You went there often and you gave gifts to the trees and speak more to that. Too. Yeah, I bring a lot of my offerings there because I live there and because I grew up there. And as I grew up learning more about my um, root, work, root work ancestry and just like my intuitive need to really like give back to the earth, I have like a really deep relationship with that land. So. Um, yeah, I feel really blessed that I was able to have folks help me bring sound and like visuals there so I could perform and have it be documented. I often sing to them without it being documented, so this was kind of the first time I was singing to them with a camera, okay. which was cool. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, speaking more to um, the ways in which your grandmother worked and the ways in which you're learning about your family lineage. Um, what ways do you work with your community to continue to share and celebrate um, your collective voice? Um, that's a really good question. I think starting off, like just growing up in Portland, I did feel really isolated as a black person and also just as a person who's black and indigenous and just like reclaiming that element of myself. So I felt really grateful to have a grandmother that was really in tune with her practice, with her hands and with the earth and like with the land because that's something that's really intuitive for both sides of my family ancestrally. Um, my mother's side is Quaker, earthy people who are very artistic and in tune with the nature and my father's side is from the south. Um, he's a cowboy so you know my family on both sides are really in tune with the nature and really giving thanks to all the elements. So. Um, you know, I also grew up like with a very spiritual influence, like both, neither of my parents really were religious. They were more interested in teaching us about infinity and like the cosmos and things like how the nature works together and everything like that. Um, so when I left Portland, I was really excited because I was able to be around more different types of people. and. When I was documenting folks in their artistic practices, I was able to really see how spirit is such a conduit in our creative purpose and practice and how that's a very important part of how we communicate with each other and with the nature. Um, so I'd say for the past 10 years, the first eight years was mostly me focusing on other artists and kind of quietly practicing on my own. but. This piece in particular in the show is more about me putting myself in my own shoes or like in the shoes of the people that I've been documenting years prior just so I could also make sure that my voice was a part of the archive. My voice is very much a part of the archive, the way I document folks. I'm, it's not really a like one-sided thing where I don't talk to the person that I'm filming. Like I've always wanted filmmaking to be more interactive, especially when a black person is filming another black person. You don't really see that much in documentary work yet, especially growing up, I didn't really see that. So that's something I wanted to create more um, within like the artistic practice realm, but also the ethnographic practice realm as well. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if that really answered your question fully though. What was the yeah. second part? Uh, the question was to share about how you celebrate the collective voices. So I oh, think yeah, you touched that. Yeah, I'm always helping create space for folks who want to be documented wherever I'm living. And I've also actively gone places to see what was going on movement wise. Um, and it just kind of naturally became all one project. Yeah. OK, awesome. So um, my next question for you is what do you feel is the function of the art institution in regards to uplifting black and brown people. This exhibition is called Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, and just sitting in the space and understanding what the beautiful work is that's here, the time that it took the artist to, to do and how uh, there's a space to, I guess, reflect yourself. Um, what are the ways you feel institutions in this moment uh, should function in uplifting black and brown folks? Mm. Well, yeah, I think the two things that come to mind is like creating space or and creating opportunities for us to make money. <laughs> those are the two first things that come up for me just because there's such a disparity of access for both of those things for black artists or black creatives. But the thing about saying black creatives for me is like, I feel like all beings are creative of some type of way because we're created by the creator. So I don't even really like to separate the concept of being 
an artist. Like I think even at the beginning when I said I was an artist, alchemist, and archivist, like those are things to help communicate in English like who I am. But the more I make this archive, the more I'm realizing that everybody has a way of expressing themselves. And I think that the disparity came in when we weren't really able to have the space to express ourselves through language, through our songs, through our medicine. And then, you know, also just not really having access to land or having access to food. So I think, yeah, institutions like this are giving us space to have access um, and also supporting us monetarily since this was also a grant, um, which was really helpful in just like making sure that I could create something at the quality I wanted to make it at. Um, because as a filmmaker, I also get to work with larger budgets and everything, but usually I'm doing a, a concept that was brought to me by that larger client. So it was nice to actually just be given a free budget to do something on my own accord that was continuing work that I've already been doing without a budget. So I really appreciated this opportunity for that reason, and I'm excited that it's with um, other artists as well that I was able to be a part of a movement with multiple folks from Oregon. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question that I didn't write down. Okay, that's fine. Um, I want to speak to you about the materials that you used for the the work. Okay. Um, in in the aspects of your voice or the film, um, in different ways that you create. Um, I want to speak to that. Like, please explain the use of the materials and and how it works with your alchemy. It's all very deep because uh, I, I always think of myself as being born a dancer. I think I was just born doing that. And through dance, I was able to find myself doing film and photography because uh, my friends at Jefferson High School, when I was in the program, desired um, audition photos and videos. And then I also desired to make money when I was in high school. So I started doing like senior portraits and weddings and stuff. So that's how I started off doing film and photography was actually through dance and just like loving to be around people. Um, my Both my father and my mother are artists as well. So I was always like really encouraged to be creating. Um, my father is a musician. So I kind of avoided making music for a while because I don't know why, but sometimes when you're around people who do stuff, you want to do your own thing. I don't know. But I found myself doing music actually more during quarantine um, because I was meditating a lot on my grandmother's land and I was hearing angel music, which is what I've been calling the genre of music I'm making, um, which is basically just like melodies that I hear in my head and then I'm able to kind of build onto it after I start singing it. I reclaimed the use of the buffalo drum in honor of my indigenous ancestors. Um, I don't have like a le le legally written down indigenous ancestry, but I know that they're there. So that's kind of my way of like reclaiming that. Um, so yeah, the dancing and the music is all kind of like a way to reclaim communication beyond English as well, because being born only being able to speak English without not necessarily being all of my ancestral languages has been like a very deep spiritual struggle for me. It makes me emotional, clearly. But yeah, so those are all the tools I was using. And then also just you, being able to ask permission from the nature as well was like a really big part of this piece. Like have, knowing that I had a deep relationship with the trees there is also really related to how I work through all of the archive. Like, I go and live somewhere for some time and then I start using my camera. So that's kind of a similar relationship to how I use, or not even use, just work with the trees that were in the piece as well. It wasn't, it wasn't like I just showed up for the first time and started using the camera. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, we can hear your voice as soon as you come in. And also it's like, in terms of all of the other imagery here or some of these other portraits, they're like, it's like weaving in with what's here because you can hear it from up here. Just wanted to mention oh, that. I forgot two other materials. I use the uh, rain stick that I've had since I was a baby. 
So I wanted to also bring in my child self through that way. And then I also have a scarf on my head that has elephants on it because my father's side is like elephant vibes. Like I always think of them as elephant ancestry. And what does that mean for you though? Um, like what, is, what does that elephant mean? Like for you specifically in terms of it, it means like different types of lineages. I, I definitely believe that there's a blood lineage to me and that's what I'm talking about when I'm referring to like indigenous or black or white ancestry. But I also believe that we have like, because we have different bodies, like a physical body and a mental body and emotional body, astral body and a spiritual body and a cosmic body. I believe that there's also like a spiritual lineage that I'm here to represent, which is like tied to the animals and the plants and because my father's side is definitely from West Africa and maybe parts of South Africa too, um, the elephant spiritual memory is something that I've been having a lot in dreams since I was a kid and just like a general like intuitive love for them and what they represent. Um, and I also like to wear white when I perform, which is really um, a symbol and an ode to Ifa and other forms of practicing with spirit and it goes through many different spiritual practices wearing white when you're in ceremony but it's kind of a way to like bring the vibration up and be a reflection of spirit when I'm performing okay um that's beautiful um you. <laughs> I want to ask also in what ways do you engage in radical living as a genius artist of this time oh wow thank you <laughs> I receive that I'm a genius artist of this time. Um, radical living is something I love to do. I definitely was given a radical lifestyle since I was born. I think I was given a very um, safe and a safe space to express myself, which I consider radical, especially as a black person and as a femme bodied person, just being able to like really figure out what truly vibrates with me on a soul level. Um, but I also am from people who are nomadic and adventurous, and I was able to kind of travel from a young age and be able to really communicate with more than just English or speaking, like communicate through body language and sound and experience and expression. Um, so yeah, I think it's radical to just like live outside of the box. I, I purposefully didn't want to get a nine to five when I left school because I felt like it would lower my vibration, like it would make my spirit, it was basically pulling away from my spirit more and I'm doing my best to get closer and closer to it through my practice because I think that that's the way I'm gonna remember everything. <laughs> so I actually finished school in Cape Town, South Africa and then I ended up um, making friends there that I was creating art with and then I came back and then I left again. I was just kind of like in this nomadic phase for a couple of years so I was living between South Africa and East Africa and parts of West Africa. I even got to do a project in Madagascar. Um, so after this traveling period where I was literally just trading free spaces to live for making content. Like I lived in a hotel, I lived in a hotel in Johannesburg, for example, and I was making stuff for their Instagram so I could stay there for free. So just kind of like finding a way to hustle and make art and live there, but also like create my own project on the side was how I created my portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, so that was about 2017 to 2018. And then after that, I was able to kind of feel more like who I am as an artist and be able to really present myself to the world as an authentic person and not just as someone who's trying to fit into anything. Um, and I'm really grateful I was able to have that space to do that and have enough confidence to really like communicate myself with other folks so I could really see where, I, where my spirit was meant to be, I guess. I hope that answered that I question. I think that answered my question. Um, I have two more questions for you, but I'm going to ask another question that I didn't ask okay. um, you before today. Um, what is your highest manifestation or your highest aspiration for black and indigenous people and artists in Portland um, moving forward into 2022 and in the future?
Um, I think this is a general manifestation, but because I'm from Portland, that definitely um, informs this manifestation. But because there's been such a lack of um, physical space that we actually are able to freely express ourselves in, I would definitely like to manifest more land for us. I actually am a co-founder of Black Oregon Land Trust which is a nonprofit where we're reclaiming land as a trust um, to buy back land for black farmers and land tenders, um, obviously incorporating collaboration with the indigenous folks of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest as well, um, because we're actually not separate at all. A lot of us are mixed within each other um, and also have a very deep relationship to how we built this land together. So. Um, I would love for us to have more land together where we can create space. Um, the intention of Activate Archive is actually to create temples down the line where the archive will actually be pres preserved in. Um, that's why I've been creating these portals right now so people can come and experience the sacred wisdom in person. Um, I got to do one at The Shed, New York last year, which is really amazing. And I also just got to do one in another space in New York a couple weeks ago. But the intention is to practice creating sacred space together and also to be able to exchange wisdom from the archive I've been building, but also to create space for other folks to really honor their archives. Because I believe all artists have really be have archives of their own and we don't really have a space to put that or to share that. And that's really uh, not very useful for our future generations to me because I feel like well, when I was a child, I wanted to know who was making things um, and I didn't really have access to that. So I would love to have land to build temples to put our archives and have it be run by folks who actually made it. Um, and I would also love more space for us to have food sovereignty mm -hmm. and other types of sovereignty that we don't have right now. But yeah, for artists, definitely more physical space and um, space to be together. Because we're meant to be together. Okay. It's the natural thing. That's a beautiful thing also. It sounds like you're focusing on the ritual of art making and sharing that and creating access is what you're focused on. Um, so that's a beautiful thing. It's inspirational. And I, I do see that as well happening. Um, I'm not sure how much more time we have. Just want to check in. Okay. How do you think archives can be used as a tool of like acting social change? How do you think archives can be used as a tool for acting social change? Yes. Okay, that's a really great question. Thank you. Who asked that question? Feel free to ask more questions. Yes. Um, but yeah, I'm doing my best to reflect my ancestors and how they use their archives for active social change, um, which includes oral storytelling and dance and drumming. Um, but I also think, um, like our ancestors, Catherine Dunham and Zora Neale Hurston, that there are ways that film and writing has also been a wonderful way to preserve our ancestry and our wisdom. Um, so I think that archiving is a catalyst for change because we're able to have documentation or a way of remembering um, our stories and our practices, um, especially having a medicine woman in my house growing up. It's really interesting now, even after she's passed, just like remembering things that she did as an action. Mm -hmm. That's even a part of an archival element for me. It doesn't have to be documented on camera. Honestly, a lot of the things I've documented on camera, I remember the more important things that I didn't get on camera. And I think that that is also a part of archiving, you know, like just really being able to be in a safe space where magic can happen and like sacredness can exist and it's not like under attack. So I think being able to create space where things aren't, where we aren't under attack is one, very rare unfortunately, and two, very necessary, um, especially in when we're in a time when we're consistently being attacked consciously or subconsciously. But I, I take it as very consciously because I'm a very conscious person. Um, but yeah, we all know what propaganda look like. We don't need no more of that. Okay, um, so we have five more minutes. I'm gonna okay. ask you one more question um, to give inspiration to anyone watching. What ways have you overcome specific challenges such as identity politics or systemic racism presented to fuel you in following your purpose? Whoa. Dang, that's a big one. Uh, well, 
I definitely use, first of all, becoming aware of my privilege as a way to fuel the ways that I'm taking up space, or not even necessarily taking up space, but just becoming more in my space. Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely been able to be aware that I am from a place that is full of nature, which is a privilege, that is a nourishing familial space, which was a privilege, um, being half white is a privilege, but being black is also a privilege. Let me say that. And then also, but it's, you know, like the word privilege is also so heavy in English and especially right now, which is not a bad thing. I think heaviness is great, but just being aware of myself and just, yeah, really getting into myself more and okay. having the time, even just having the privilege to do that, you know, just knowing that I'm at- awareness instead of privilege. Right, awareness instead of privilege. I appreciate that. Yeah, just being aware that I'm at a very special part of my lineage where I'm able to really sit and meditate on how I want to be and who I want to be and not let it be at the expense of my comfort or my life path, the reason why I was born. Um, but yeah, I've definitely overcome a lot of moments where I've made myself small or I haven't really spoken up in ways that I wish that I did, but I think that's also just a way that I was like, a way that I'm meant to learn more about myself. So I try not to be too hard about myself in those moments. Um, I think moving to New York really helped me <laughs> be more confident with myself and like just not be in a passive aggressive environment, be, learn how to be more like clear about my intentions of space and like who I am. But that also has to do with growing up too. Like, you know, going from my young 20s to later 20s was really helpful for that. Shout out the youngins. We love y'all, but yeah. I don't know if that really answered your question. That was a good question, though. It sounds like you, you focus on your awareness, but you also took risk. Yes, I took a lot of risks. And I also made a... I didn't make mistakes, but I feel like some people were not feeling me taking risks sometimes, which was okay. Well, it's definitely you know? not about other people. You focus on yourself, kind of. Yeah, no, I definitely have put myself first in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. that's and that's something that I'm proud of. And I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to make that choice. Awesome. I'm happy that you <laughs> did that, Anaka, for yourself and for everyone here, um, and for you know t taking the efforts to try and not even to try to do the things that you believe are needed to reflect your ritual, reflect your ancestry, your ancestry, and. I just understand the moment um, that you're, you are in and not be uh, held back by anything. Right, I think there's a lot of um, numbing that has happened over the past however many generations between how we're supposed to live according to spirit and how we're supposed to live according to the way we were told to live um, by other humans. So I'm doing my best to listen less to humans and listen more to the spirits. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Um, is there anything else? Any other questions? No? Okay. Any questions from you ladies? No. Okay. Well, I would love to say thank you again for the Black Lives Matter Artist Grant. You guys should come into PSU to check it out. It's an amazing show um, full with sculpture and video and so many things, paintings. Um, I want to shout out all of the artists who are a part of the show did amazing work. It'll be running through April, April 30th. So come, please. We'd love to, we'd love yeah. to see you there. Um, again, I'm Danae Howard, also Art School Scammer. You can find my, my work. I'm also an artist and curator. You can find my work at artschoolscammer.com or artschoolscammer on everything. Um, and I think that's it. It was lovely being with you tonight, and I hope to see you all soon. Peace, 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 peace.